Hey, good, good afternoon. John Fox, Security PFE of Microsoft. Uh, what I'm going to do here is a, a little adaptation from a, a presentation that was done by uh, one of our cyber architects, in fact, our lead security architect who speaks at DEF CON and various others, Lee Holmes, uh, around defending against the world of PowerShell attacks and, and how the opportunity is really no longer present in, in the modern landscape of things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive into the, uh, the abyss of things, the normal uh, issues that happen to occur in most environments and how PowerShell is leveraged uh, as an opportunistic tool uh, in the attack structure of things, whether that's coming in by way of email, uh, you know, directly embedded uh, code with the emails or attached through documents and things in the office perspective of things like that. Uh, but also understanding that PowerShell can run pretty much anywhere that the engine uh, is portable. Uh, so that's embedded in other applications and things of that nature. By far the most opportunistic uh, of these events are where we see the, the, the embedded macros and codes that come within Office documents. Uh, take an example of a Word doc or something that may be embedded in Excel or even an Access database. Uh, the Visual Basic for applications or VBA scripts that can actually embed um, what is essentially PowerShell execution. Um, simple little macro, has a little bit of code, calls out, runs as the user, in many cases that administrative user having local rights that allow for not only things to occur locally to take over that system, but also happen to span the network in multiple systems allowing the, the potential attacker or the command and control system to, to scan the network, find the, the sweet spots, find that data, and actually perform the exfiltration back through this user's email account or uh, some of the other things that they might be using uh, from an application stack. And unfortunately, even with all the controls that may be put in front of that user, like are you sure you want to open this you know, potentially threatening object and do you want to remove the security, do you want to trust this code, we find that users, when they look at the things, have real no idea of what that code happens to represent, let alone be able to identify what is actually you know, malicious uh, from the intent. And there's many different kinds of things that, uh, uh, you know, that are leveraged in the, in the long stream of, of, of kill chains. Uh, when we look at advanced persistent threats, or the APTs as we call them, you know, what are they looking for? What's in that toolbox? And in many cases, we find that there's an opportunistic opportunity, therefore, uh, let's see if we can use PowerShell in that default trustworthiness that exists within a given system. And, and that's, you know, unfortunately, the, uh, the you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak. And, and it does happen. You know, we have a, a problem with embedded commands and these things are easy to find and obfuscation is, a, is an easy way to encode things. And we know that from telemetry data that by far the most common thing that is packaged uh, is an executable, is an EXE, but that's not the limitation. It could be much more than that. So, and in fact, you might not even ever see PowerShell.exe in some of these uh, types of attacks. And these things are embedded in so many of the bad toolkits that are out there, whether it's the Mimikatz or Empire, um, uh, Bloodhound and things of that nature, the social engineering toolkit. They leverage that kind of trustworthiness that exists not only in the Windows platform anymore, but because of .NET Core and PowerShell Core, you know, it's now bridging over into uh, many other operating systems. But it's not the only thing to be concerned about. You know, when you look at the attacker's uh, little playbook of things that, you know, as exploitation options, PowerShell is just one of those. You still have all the other scripting languages, you have the other methodologies that are in place. However, for some reason, we find that organizations think that the silver magic bullet uh, is we'll just block PowerShell. But if you look at MITRE's attack uh, landscape of all the different things that happen, PowerShell is just this one little tiny place uh, on that map. And it's, you know, that tends to be the, the default course of action. And it ends up having this type of result. You put in one particular roadblock and it's so easy to get around that. Um, and what, what you effectively do is you take away the best administrative tool that you have and probably one of the more secure administrative tools in the environment, forcing users to go around the control, to go around that block and do things that are much less secure and are gonna potentially uh, expose the, the landscape much more so than if you were to leave PowerShell uh, in its default uh, place. The other thing too is that blocking PowerShell doesn't really provide protection. PowerShell is an engine. Um, it's not an executable. 
So you can actually get PowerShell in many other flavors, some of those being, you know, like this little tool here and, and many, many others. So essentially what you're trying to do by crossing off this one little tiny, you know, remote code execution square on, on the attack uh, framework, um, you've really raised the, the opportunity for all, all the others that, that still exist there. Uh, and it's just not, uh, uh, you know, the ideal approach by any means. When it comes to uh, Maslow's hierarchy of security controls, obviously the protect, detect, and respond, or prevent, detect, and remediate uh, frameworks exist. Um, there's more things that are in place in PowerShell to protect uh, the environment as opposed to trying to do something reactive and, and restricting or detecting what may have happened. In fact, there's something across all three stages of this that exists natively in PowerShell uh, that introduced as part of the management framework uh, beginning in version five. If you compare it to the other uh, opportunities or the other methodologies that are used for administration, PowerShell has the, the one across the board where there's so much transparency and visibility and opportunity to log and to inspect and at least have the knowledge of what took place not to mention the third-party interactions with NMLware uh, scan interfaces and other APIs uh, that are available. We've listened to all the concerns that happen with PSExec and PowerShell, and we've kind of built that into the default uh, uh, landscape of things, and that's continued to evolve, evolve into the next versions of PowerShell. We also partner very, very heavily with the Python community, and in fact, Python and, and the poor world is getting much more secure as well. Um, and where you're finding that being a, a native tool in Windows, uh, it's starting to have some of those exact same uh, behaviorals and insights uh, uh, as far as what's happening, what's going on, and the system protecting the environment. When you look at uh, some additional things that we would encourage the use of PowerShell is getting into just enough and just in time uh, type administrative models. Just enough administration means that when I use PowerShell, I'm exposed to a constrained language as we call it, meaning I only have the commandlets that I need to perform that task. I'm not exposed to the entire you know, module set or all the parameters that may be available. Uh, and that's something that's very, very uh, useful because instead of having the ability to run the code that, that can do pretty much anything, uh, you know, we want to focus that into the exact intent uh, or the purpose of that administrative event. If I'm logging into a DNS server, then only DNS commands. If I'm logging into a, 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 an application server, then only commandlets and, and modules that are respective to that application should be exposed. So I'm basically reducing the likelihood and definitely removing the opportunity for abuse of that administrative tool simply because it's present. I go in with a specific task that's focused in my, in my language use in that environment. By default, PowerShell is wide open. I've got all the capabilities and I've got all the time in the world as long as I'm in that shell to do things. But when we talk about just enough administration, as combined with just in time, then I have a very particular point in time and a single session in which that PowerShell is available. And I combine that with the just enough administration. I now have the, a, a scoped level of, of capabilities that will intersect and provide exactly what should be done. And it's very easy to orchestrate or to put into like ITSM tickets. So therefore you can have someone who's handling things at a lower tier of, of response not having to be as fully knowledgeable of the language because there's going to be only a certain number of commands uh, that can be leveraged. And it ends up with something like this. You end up with commandlets that are scoped within that session. So I only have you know, certain verbs, certain nouns, or only certain parameters, and those parameters can be pre-filled with you know, local host only. So I can't use uh, computer parameters that target other systems. I can't use credential parameters that allow me to leverage stolen uh, uh, artifacts uh, that might exist in the, in the environment. It also utilizes local sandboxing. It's a simple registry key. It isolates the execution from the system. I can't jump into other processes or, or interact with DLLs and, and things that would be highly suspicious on any type of NMI or scan or any type of security suite that exists on the environment. So you end up with this wonderful, nice intersection of, of control that truly is just enough administration without removing any of the tools uh, whatsoever. The other thing too is understanding that PowerShell is transparent. This is one of the big advocacies behind using it and keeping it in the system because it no longer allows for attackers to hide and pull things off uh, because the tool simply exists there. There are so many controls 
These can be performed by way of group policy. They can be done in PowerShell profiles. You've got pipeline logging. You also have system level transcripts that can be done in different uh, uh, ways. And then with, even within nested script block logging, you have the ability to, even though there may be something that's encoded, uh, obfuscated in a way that a user may not know is happening, or maybe it is the attacker, the adversary who's trying to run something and get around all the controls, it's still in the clear text for uh, the system that's sitting underneath everything. So when we look at something that's been obfuscated and how it's stored in the event log, yes, you've got an embedded inv invoke expression that may have some bad things, but the reality is that now the system no longer stores the events in this fashion, which are hard to detect and hard to run analyzation against. You actually get the clear text of what it was translated into. Uh, so now that you have the ability to search for certain verbs or keywords and, and obviously see exactly what took place on the system, and you don't have to store these logs on the local system, which may be compromised, where the attacker could remove the evidence. This can actually be sent to centralized systems or collected in, you know, through various third-party SIMs. And then the extra added benefit is if you take some of the uh, third-party anti-malware, especially like Defender ATP, something that's heavily obfuscated now goes into the anti-malware engine. And even though it looks like a bunch of gobbledygook to the users, it's something that's going to be understood and blocked uh, by that Defender uh, engine. With, of course, that same result happening in the log that we had something that was this big, massive script block obfuscated into characters that no one would understand, but it's actually been blocked, it's been learned, it goes into the telemetry, the learning uh, elements underneath that system, and then it shares that intelligence to the rest of the protected systems in your environment. So where you may have an initial host, patient zero or patient two or three, the likelihood is over a short number of seconds that information is shared to the rest of the environment and is protected. There's useful events that make it very, very simple. It's only a, a, a couple of there that, that have to be done. And you don't have to deal with the, the complexity that came with trying to block you know, some of the things with your security controls that limit the functionality of the environment because every time you add a new rule or a new control, as this sign kind of indicates there, there's always a way around it. So even though you block all the other wheeled elements from the sidewalk environment, there's still that one admin who knows how to ride the unicycle. Uh, and because unicycles aren't explicitly blocked, of course he can go on his, his merry way. With combining PowerShell with some of the other uh, security suite elements, uh, that are native to the operating system now. Again, speaking of Windows 10 and Server 2016 and moving forward, you know, the, it enhances that uh, capability of protection. And the constrained language mode, which jumps in, of course, limits what can potentially happen. And then logging can be done secure. So if you are passing credentials or you are passing certain strings that you don't want uh, to find in the logs, um, those things can be protected as well or sent to systems where the, the security operations center or the people who should be able to see those details or at least be privy to it uh, aren't obstructed in any given way. We also have the ability to scan your scripts or scan your environment at scale. There's available gallery uh, objects that can then be used for uh, you know, scanning script repositories, scanning code, running this in real time against the environment. And when it comes to like looking at injection uh, hunter type tools, the ability to scan that repository and look and actually tell you line by line where something is obfuscated or something is malicious, something that is almost impossible to do from the human eye level or human intelligence perspective. Uh, so you can run this against you know, entire repositories in, in your given environment. And it's a very, very powerful thing when you look at the injection hunter module that's out there. These same tools are now compatible with and work within uh, uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, so now if you're using a single development platform in your environment, uh, you're basically checking off all the boxes that are needed uh, from a security perspective in that given environment. And the other thing too is there's default behaviors that prevent the old known baddies that still exist out there. One of the biggest, of course, is downgrade behaviors. You can control and, and block downgrade, meaning, well, I know that what I need to do is bad and, and the only way to really pull it off on the system is if I downgrade to version two or version one of PowerShell or go into some weird .NET ob uh, obstructs that are out there. You know, and that's, that was a, a fun playland for quite some time. But what we've ended up creating in the world that promised a lot of freedom for attackers because PowerShell is native to the OS, it's always in the system, administrators have un, you know, uh, constrained access to it whatsoever, 
we've actually delivered what we call slavery uh, in that it's no longer an attacker's tool. It really is one of the most powerful things uh, in the administrator's toolbox. And there's all kinds of comments that have been placed out there by some of the more notables uh, in the world of cyber uh, and even from the dark side of, of, of ATPs. And the one that I want to close on is, is probably one of my favorites. The transparency is so good in PowerShell now that now adversaries are looking into other languages, other methodologies with less or no security insight just because it's become so well. Thank you.